Let me introduce the next speaker who is going to talk about Gramin Bharat, urban India and the region in between. The subject is of huge interest in current context for architects and planners because of massive urban transformation which will pose unprecedented challenges in urban, rural areas and areas in between. Our speaker is a professor and inaugural director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Alberta, Canada. He is also an associate chair in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. He has been a visiting fellow at the University of Toronto, IIT Roorkee and Jawaharlal Nehru University. His research interests may vary from sustainable urban and regional planning, multiculturalism, human rights to international planning, with a focus on India, Sri Lanka, Brazil and the Middle East. He has authored two books titled Understanding India's New Approach to Spatial Planning and Development, A Shalianship, published by Oxford University Press, New Delhi. He has lectured at MIT, the University of Toronto, McGill University, IIT Roorkee and other distinguished institutions worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandeep Agarwal. Thank you for this kind inv invitation from the SRM Institute of Science and Technology. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've titled my presentation, Grameen Bharat, Urban India, and the region that's Chetra in between. I would like first to talk about the recent shifts in India in planning, that is its overall trajectory. Uh, some of it is based on my recent book, Understanding India's New Approach to Spatial Planning and Development, a salient shift that I have co-authored. I will uncover some differences and similarities between two models, the mega project-based uh, Nehruvian planning and development model that was in use from 1947 till about 1967, and then the current post-liberalization model that's been employed since uh, 1991. I will close with three suggestions about uh, we most need to pay attention to. They are to do with Grameen Bharat, urban India, and the region that's Chetra uh, in between. During India's first economic development phase, um, after becoming independent, a development model based on mega projects such as building dams or new cities contributed to India's early economic development. This model helped to shape the country's infrastructure and spatial development landscape. Interestingly, it appears that we have come to a full circle in the fourth phase, that is from 1991 to present, given the renewed focus on mega projects. The second phase um, from 1967 to 1984, primarily focused on rural India to reduce poverty and food scarcity. The third phase uh, from 1984 to 1991 was to do with a gradual shift from rural development focused policies to technology-based modernization and limited deregulation of the industry. The current mega project phase is, is exemplified by the interstate industrial corridor projects such as the Delhi-Mumbai industrial corridor and the smart cities mission. The difference with these projects is that they focus mostly on individual infrastructure and economic development, sometimes overlooking linking to place-based planning for local people. So the National Government of India has simultaneously pursued three kinds of policy in the current phase. One is the place-based economic development, then it's the infrastructure building, and third uh, is the welfare schemes. So place-based economic development, um, not planning per se, um, use public funds to leverage private investment and encourage 
civic involvement such as for for profit uh, colleges and hospitals industrial states and integrated townships the second one the infrastructure building for instance is about highway projects such as pradhan mantri uh, sadak yojana and the golden quadrilateral uh, that improves the economic integration and spatial development of the nation third one is the welfare schemes um, they have actually been on, on on rise and they aim to selectively target the urban and rural poor such as uh, the national rural livelihood mission people's pensions and and so on with these policies the post liberalization regime not only seeks to balance the demands of economic growth and public welfare but also aims to find a way to combine these seemingly uh, incompatible goals so with the larger shifts as the backdrop um, i would suggest that uh, central and state governments must pay urgent attention to all three entities and they are urban local bodies that i call urban india rural areas that the gramin bharat and the regions uh, chetra in between uh, and let's have a closer look at each of these entities so first it's about urban local bodies that need our attention so strengthening the urban local bodies uh, is the way to positively harness many of the ongoing shifts in india's largest cities this would entail devolving responsibility for urban planning and development responsibilities to local planning actors as well as development processes and frameworks to coordinate different kinds of planning efforts so first uh, for local people linkages often don't form between infrastructure activities and place based planning it is because local governments are neither empowered nor possess Uh, the capacity to conceive manage and fund the development of spatial plans and downstream projects this is the case for more than two decades after the 74th constitutional amendment passed which called for local governments to assume these responsibilities indeed these functions are still predominantly controlled by the state governments which seek to retain the authority over both urban and rural areas one of the issues here is that even where these functions are performed by a local elected or semi autonomous institution like a municipal corporation or a development agency these institutions are led by bureaucrats who answer to uh, the state governments and not to the institutions themselves the second point i want to make here is that there is a lack of mechanisms to link larger scale national and state level infrastructure plans with the planning for urban regions and local places i argue that administratively technically and financially strong local governments are better able to anticipate and respond to the larger and ongoing shift shaping local places than are a distant state or central level uh, central level government further centrally sponsored programs such as the dmic or smart cities mission will be restrained from running roughshod over settlements they cross when strong local governments can integrate their local plans with such regional state and national level initiatives third point i'll make here is strong local governments can help fund local spatial development for instance indian cities charge little or no property taxes this in part because they lack political support and institutional capacity to develop a robust tax role and collect uh, due taxes many of the non traditional revenue sources such as an impact fee or the sale of development rights require detailed knowledge of local real estate markets infrastructure requirements and the legal environment they also depend on the technical capacity to design and implement long range financial models strong local governments are a prerequisite for building the revenue streams required to fund such local plans and projects so the key solution to these issues lies in digitizing tax collection as a part of the digital india goals which include 
um, a collection of property taxes and taxes on other uh, municipal services would facilitate urban planning goals. A second solution is through the Smart Cities Mission or Amruth, that is the Atul Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation, another avenue that could enable and empower municipal governments. However, creating privately run independent special purpose vehicles, SPV as they are known, to deliver smart cities or limited term city mission management units for Amrut could do the opposite, further delegitimizing the role of local government. The second um, body that I mentioned is the rural bodies and they also need our attention. In both rural and not so rural areas, planning for and providing basic infrastructure matters just as much it matters in urban areas. So I'm thinking of uh, in a rural context, such things as internal roads, regular electricity supply, adequately staffed schools and hospitals. Uh, most importantly, judiciously conceived spatial plans for these remote places developed by local people rather than centrally imposed from outside the region can make a much bigger difference uh, to, func to, uh, to how they function and how they are experienced by people. Notably, um, local governments in the rural areas like panchayats already have some experience in this regard. For instance, they approve and help implement almost all the development projects and social welfare schemes in their jurisdiction. And they're also institutionally capable of receiving and using funds from both the central and state governments. However, uh, what many panchayats crucially lack is the capacity to conceive and develop spatial plans and downstream projects in-house at a time when it is becoming increasingly clear that they should be undertaking such activities. We need students um, who are graduating with requisite skills to tackle these issues in rural areas. This requires an understanding of crop patterns, the rural economy, rural culture, the local political system, and of course, planning principles. Over 1000 planners emerge every year from more than 25 public and private institutions in India. India has about 8,000 cities and towns, 600 districts, uh, and over 400,000 villages. So these figures make clear that India does not have enough planners, even if um, uh, one town planner is deployed in each of these places that I mentioned. However, I hear anecdotally uh, that these new graduates cannot find appropriate employment in their field, even in the face of the severe and urgent need. So clearly something is, is amiss here. Here's another reason to focus on rural. Rural is not rural anymore, as it now requires the same type of amenities and facilities as urban areas. I will not talk about census towns and our urban clusters and the debates around them, which you may already be familiar with. These are the areas which are already turning or have turned urban. I would like to instead to introduce a new term which I call you rural that acknowledges the emergence of urban characteristics in remote rural areas that are outside of metropolitan zones. Even these areas are experiencing increasing populations, population density, land use changes, economic shifts, and other changes. Under the cl current classification, they meet the criteria to be classified as urban, hence they are in need of all the amenities and um, hard infrastructure and facilities the urban centers need, such as portable water, electrification, sewage and drainage systems, and health and educational facilities. So third element of this is the areas between, in between, uh, that is the regions, um, the city regions or rural regions. Regional planning deals with efficient placement of land use activities, infrastructure, and settlement growth across a large area of land than an individual city or town. Why do we need it? Today's economic and social activities are not limited to a small geography. Our 
daily economic and social activities play out over extensive areas, regions that seldom correspond to political and administrative boundaries. Take air and water as examples. Few communities can supply their own water or dispose of their own waste. This is the same with mobility and transportation, which is a factor because where people live and where they work may be far apart. Thus highways and transit are on the front lines of our regional planning efforts, as well as the city's waste landfills are located in the peri-urban villages. While urban and rural environments continue to remain distinctive, uh, but uh, their present as well as futures are closely interconnected. These issues are especially important in India, where settlements are very interconnected through shared economies, cultures, and natural and physical factors. Some factors here are uh, temporary or seasonal migrants who migrate for periods of time to nearby towns, district centers, or village, or nearby villages for economic reasons, and or settlements that may share the same source of water for drinking, be it a river, a lake, or a pond. India can certainly draw lessons from other countries on the question of regional boundaries. For example, Canada is a nation of regions, as are countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Some useful questions here are these. How are regional boundaries determined in these countries? How was the governance system created? And how is planning done at the regional level? So in the province um, of Alberta and Canada, where I'm from, for instance, the regions are based on the watershed areas of the seven rivers in the province. Um, and then you can see them in, in the map here. Uh, a metropolitan region encompasses in the Canadian context, a metro city or the mother city and the area around it, um, as in the case of census metropolitan area, that is the CMA of Toronto or Vancouver and so on. So a CMA, which is a short form of the census metropolitan area is a city region that is like a galaxy of linked employment, retail and institutional centers. A multi-metropolitan region consists of something like the Golden um, Horseshoe in Ontario, which consists of nine CMAs, including Toronto and 110 municipal and other government units, as you see um, in this slide. Delhi NCR is the only institutionalized region in India that follows this model closely. It is comprised of Delhi and four other prominent cities and 24 districts spread across three states. Peripheral source regions are uh, another form where resource development dominates the economy and the population is dispersed as is the case in Northern Ontario region in, in Canada. British Columbia, another province in Canada, uh, what they have is something called regional districts and they arose out of uh, a need for greater regional cooperation and equitable cost sharing between municipal areas and rural areas. Similar to the current situation in India, back in 1950s, British Columbia was experiencing a rapid urbanization resulting in developments in rural areas with residents commuting to urban centers for work from rural areas. Development in rural areas increased the demand for services such as water, sewage, and then comes other things like zoning and other forms of uh, planning tools. It was formed in 1965 and the regional district now has evolved into a form of local government um, at the regional level that provides much needed services such as water, fire protection, recreation facilities, and waste disposal in rural areas. So the recommendations made in the background report for the 73rd and the 74th amendments uh, in the Indian constitution propose that the planning regions could be classified under three levels. First is administrative regions, such as district regions or metropolitan regions, investment regions such as new investment manufacturing zones, 
special investment regions and so on. And then third one is the special regions such as very sensitive areas, economically sensitive areas or politically sensitive areas. Establishing regional planning at the district level within the current administrative structure under the district magistrate seems like a logical place to introduce these regions since this body is the seat of administration at the district level and is affiliated with the policing, district courts, and the registration of various personnel and property documents. Perhaps the Prime Minister's Rural Development Fellowship Program could be an accessible vehicle to start this off. So in closing, my contention is that India's rapid economic growth brings with it a fundamental shift in the form of a massive urban transformation and is not limited to cities and is possibly the largest national urban transformation of the 21st century. This will pose unprecedented challenges to growing Grameen Bharat, urban India, and the regions in between to provide housing and infrastructure such as water, sewage, transportation, and so on. The government of, and its various institutions and all of us as individuals must prepare for the urbanization that is taking place in all parts of India, uh, be they uh, cities, villages, and regions in between. One other note I would like to make is that city building does not happen in a five-year interval or um, with the help of short-term projects. As they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. It needs time to create great things. So it takes years and years of concerted efforts by government institutions and with the involvement of private and informal sectors of the society and above all us um, uh, who, are, who are to participate in this process. So thank you very much and... Um Thank you, Dr. Sandeep Agarwal, for your thought-provoking presentation on massive urban transformation and the unprecedented challenges in urban and rural areas. Free flow is a self-compacting concrete. After pouring into the form, this concrete makes its way through steel and narrow spaces to completely fill the structure without any cavities, without any manual labor involvement. Ultratech Free Flow Plus has been awarded Green Pro Certification Product by Green Products and Service Council. Benefits to the end customer. Free flow is highly durable and it increases life of structure as this concrete allows complicated designs without any voids. Faster work as concrete placement is very fast and no compaction is required. Cost effective as less manpower is required at site. Reduction in noise pollution as Ultratech free flow does not require vibrators. It also saves cost. Superior surface finish as it has unique self-compacting feature. Improved durability due to denser microstructure of concrete. This concrete does not have any voids, so there are no leakage problems. Benefits for applicators and technical influencers. Reduction in time and resources required for compaction and placement of concrete. It enables speedy construction and reduction in manpower at site, thus resulting in labor savings. Faster construction allows applicators to take more projects. Greater freedom in designing complicated, intricate and elegant structures. It gives superior surface finish without any blemishes and patchwork, so the contractor has a goodwill in the market. Reduction in noise pollution, as Ultratech free flow does not require vibrators, it also saves cost. Freeflow Plus is designed using special high-performance plasticizers and viscosity-modifying agents in order to give a highly flowable and self-compacting concrete mix. Freeflow Plus is delivered at sites using 5 to 6 cubic meters transit mixers and also 12-liter buckets for smaller quantities. On arrival, concrete should be tested for its workability and flowability.
Before application, the formwork should be sturdy, leak-proof and clean from debris. Ultratech Free Flow Plus, being a flowable concrete product, exercises higher hydrostatic pressure on the formwork. There should be a lot more care in setting up the formwork support to ensure safety at site since it is a high pressure. It requires minimum manual efforts in spreading and compacting. Normally, Ultratech Free Flow Plus would not require use of needle vibrators. In case of heavily reinforced structures, only a minor need of needle vibrator should suffice. In case during concreting, leakages are observed from the formwork, the pouring should be temporarily halted and resumed after plugging the leakages. While concreting, in hot weather, water may be sprinkled over the reinforcement and formwork to bring the temperature to normal conditions. The surface should be protected from sunlight and wind to prevent evaporation of water from concrete and protect it from shrinkage and cracking. Normal methods adopted are water sprinkling, covering by tarpaulin sheets, wet hesian clothes or misting, humidification. After the hardening of concrete, it can be ponded with water for 7 to 14 days.